Dale Allison is the Richard J. Dearborn Professor of New Testament Studies at Princeton Theological Seminary. He's a Matthean scholar. His three-volume commentary on Matthew, that is co-authored with W.D. Davies, is the gold standard when it comes to commentaries on Matthew. So first of all, there's a problem for evangelical scholars, because I don't think any of these people are on, tr on traditional theories of authorship independent of, of each other. So if you think Mark was written by John Mark and Luke by Luke, they are together in Paul's epistles. They're hanging out together. They're talking to each other. Mm. And the author of Mark is talking to Paul on the traditional theory, and as well as Peter, and Luke is talking to Paul. They, they must be sitting around the campfire or the shop talking about these things off and on. Um, and if Mark is getting some of his stuff from Peter, and you think John, the son of Zebedee, wrote John, well, heck, the first few chapters of Acts have Peter and John hanging out together, spending all sorts of time together. They're also together in Galatians. So if you want a... Um, if, if you have a modern trial, what, what do you want to have from the witnesses? You don't want them to have post-event contact. You want to have truly independent witnesses. As far as I can tell, on the traditional theories of authorship, all these people are talking to each other all the time, so they're not truly independent in any way at all. That's had a huge impact on me. I've also told stories, and within a week heard someone else tell that story, and it's already morphing into something else. Mm. Uh, I remember being at Duke as a graduate student and hearing a legend about Dale Allison. <laughs> me by somebody who knew me, being spread by people who were there when I was there. It was not true, but mm. people were spreading this story. And the fact that I said that didn't happen, I'm sure it didn't stop the spread uh, of the story. But with regard to the physicality of, of the appearances, it makes sense uh, to me that even if those things did not happen, it, they, it would be not be unexpected to find them uh, in the text, because they serve apologetical elements. You know, the Gospel of John is related to 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, and there's some sort of interaction with a um, um, proto-docetism or, or, or something like that. The importance of Jesus physically coming uh, in the flesh is there in John's world. And in Luke, this serves an apologetical motif, that is, um, um, Jesus is not a ghost. And of course, that's one of the things people have always said. The disciples saw a ghost or they hallucinated or so on. And I would expect early Christians to come up with a counter to that at some point. What apologists tend to do is when people cite parallels to the resurrection, let's say uh, other visions of, of dead people or other stories of, of empty tombs and so on, what apologists tend to do is to bat away the parallels as quickly as possible because, understandably, for theological reasons, you want Jesus' resurrection to be unique. So your job, part of your job, is to downplay and dismiss parallels. The polemicists, the opponents, their job is to play them up because they will say, well, we have these other empty tomb stories, they're legends, so this one must be a legend, or all these people see Jesus, they're clearly hallucinating, or all these people see Mary, they're clearly hallucinating. So, um, so, so what people are doing is they're using parallels either to attack or they are trying to get rid of the parallels. I'm doing neither one, so this is why nobody's going to understand what I'm doing. I am trying to push parallels <clears throat> as far as I can in order to think. Apologists won't like um, a theme that runs through this uh, book, which is how little we know. So I come back to this again and again and again. So you take the appearance to the 500. You just ask any question, and you don't know the answer. Who were these people? Were they in the South? Were they in the North? Were they in Galilee? Were they in Jerusalem? I think myself that about the only thing we can know is that 
or, or, or say is probable is that it's post-Pentecostal. I can't imagine a crowd of 500 being gathered uh, before the public proclamation uh, of the resurrection at Pentecost. So I think this is a post-Pentecostal crowd. But what they saw, how many of these people knew Jesus really well? How did they see him? Really, how did they see him? Uh, 500 people, that's a lot. Now it's gotta be an approximation, but did, was there a receiving line? <laughs> was there a jumbotron? Uh, some of the church fathers actually think this must have been something like Acts, a heavenly vision. So he, he's somewhere up in the, the clouds and, you know, they can see him at once. Anyway, my point is that I, I don't know the answers to any of these questions. I can't name a single person who was there. So you could say thousands saw Mary or let's let's say thousands saw the sun dance at Fatima in Portugal. Right. Nin 19, what, 18? Okay, that's it. So what really happened? The fact that we have a sentence there and that I actually think something happened doesn't tell us what it was. Right. Uh, but again, I don't know what happened at all. That's my point. I don't know what happened. Maybe somebody worked them into a, uh, a fervor, like at an evangelistic uh, service. Uh, if it's after Pentecost, the people have to know people have already seen Jesus, maybe he appeared, maybe somebody said, oh, look, he's in the clouds. Uh, and who knows? Maybe he was in the clouds. But maybe he wasn't in the clouds. I'm just saying, as an historian, I, d I don't know what, what what to do with this. One of my historical critical conclusions is that the story in Matthew 27, 51 through 53 is not history. So you would agree with that. But I've argued that Matthew thought it was. And if Matthew thought it was, that means you have uh, what you could only call fiction uh, in, in the canonical uh, stories uh, themselves. But if I were a skeptic, I would say, well, Jesus prophesied um, catastrophe and redemption. He prophesied um, tribulation and vindication. He prophesied death and resurrection. Uh, and maybe he did these things uh, because he was thinking eschatologically. But we do know, we do know from history that sometimes groups have taken prophecies that were not fulfilled, at least to everybody who doesn't belong to the group, and claimed that they were fulfilled.